EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning in ICT and is part of the Foundation's Young Africa Works programming. Hello and welcome to this edition of EdTech Mondays Africa. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. And on this edition, we are talking about accelerating digital literacy to benefit education systems in Africa. And just to share a bit of context, despite the technology investments made of the world's 20 countries with the weakest digital literacy skills, 12 of them are in Africa. And only 11% of Africa's tertiary education graduates have formal digital training about 87% of African business leaders identify digital literacy skills development as a priority area in need of further investment. In 2022, African countries scored between 1.8 and 5 on the Digital Skills Gap Index, which is below the global average of 6. That in addition to internet coverage of 40% in Sub-Saharan Africa. However, the benefits of digital literacy are immeasurable. Digital literacy helps promote academic growth and also helps students learn how to effectively use digital tools in different areas of their lives. And there's, however, a significant problem in assessing digital tools for teaching, especially in countries with unreliable internet access and lower income levels. So the question we are asking is, what initiatives are we taking in Africa to accelerate digital literacy to benefit education systems and human capital development across the continent? Allow me to introduce our panelists, uh, Evgenia Savchenko, who is a senior economist, Education Global Practice, Eastern and Southern Africa region at the World Bank. She specializes in education, skills development, human capital and labor markets, She's led policy dialogue and operations in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Nigeria and Cameroon on skills development and general education. We also have Gabby Ibelman, who is the founder and CEO of MindJoy, an edtech startup that is building an operating system for boundless classroom learning, powered by artificial intelligence. We also have in studio with us, Elid Chemueno, who is the lead e-learning at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at the MasterCard Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good to have you on this edition of EdTech, where we're talking about a timely conversation on uh, fostering digital literacy uh, conversations across the African continent and what that could look like for our education systems as well. To start us off on this conversation, Elid, what are your thoughts on uh, digital literacy for education in Africa. And when you think about it, really, I'll break it down into two, pre-COVID and post-COVID. So when you look at pre-COVID, uh, uh, one could make the argument that the skills um, were perhaps a lot more low. And, but during the COVID period and post-COVID period, you've probably seen a lot more acceleration of, uh, of these digital skills, primarily because of being forced into this kind of way we had to learn and and, and use and interact with a lot of technology during this period. But having said that, I think it varies from one country to the other. Um, uh, other countries, certainly, as you rightly mentioned, uh, we look at the digital skills uh, index. So other countries are much more lower, other countries are a lot more high. And even within those specific countries, um, within the urban centers and the rural areas, that would also vary. That, again, there's still a lot of challenges to do with connectivity. There's still a lot of challenges to do with the infrastructure and also policy, as, as it were. And Gabby, what are your thoughts on digital literacy as we see it on the African continent? As we move into a world where global opportunities are becoming more and more available for young people, um, it becomes more and more essential that um, our young people are able to compete globally for job opportunities. And I think um, that requires us to start interventions at a really young age. You know, if you're a student who the first time you only use a computer is at university level, you're so much farther behind your counterparts who've started building their digital literacy skills um, in their early years. And so I think um, that starts with a generational gap our teaching force is not digitally literate and that brings a challenge and poses a challenge to introducing technology into the classroom and so really I think there's it's a really exciting time with um I'm I'm very excited about the opportunity that artificial intelligence brings um to helping uh, Africa leapfrog 
but I do think um, it is something we have to take seriously. And I'm particularly excited about mobile in Africa and leveraging mobile first interventions um, because we have um, some of the leading mobile infrastructure in the world. And I think that could be a portal to digital skills for our classrooms where the computer infrastructure is not in place. Personally, and I think it's also the opinion of the World Bank, digital skills, digital literacy is the number one priority in education sector. I view digital skills on the same right now level as numeracy and literacy. All kids uh, for the future have to be equipped with the digital skills. Let me put my economist hat on and just give you a few bites of statistics. Digital economy in Africa only, I'm not talking even about a global penetration, uh, is poised to reach 180 billion by 2025 within just next couple of years. By 2050, it's going to be $712 billion. The opportunity is just, just enormous. In terms of demand from the employers, 65 uh, percent of individuals recruited for jobs at the African company surveyed in 2019 required at least basic level of digital skills. And this was pre-pandemic times. Imagine now. Uh, let's talk about population. By 2030, Africa will encompass around 625 uh, million people. Uh, around 2030, it's going to be the largest labor force on the planet. Having digital skills is absolutely paramount for this labor force to really take advantage of the future uh, economy. All right. Thank you so much, Evgenia, for that. And also for sharing those uh, deep statistics that we're looking at. I mean, by the time we think about how education systems can play a role in making the digital economy even more uh, fruitful in the future, you can't actually talk about that without looking into conversations around what exactly digital literacy training looks like, even in the most basic of uh, situations. And I think, Gabby, I want to hear your thoughts on this because you touched on a mobile first uh, continent that we are. But really, what does digital literacy um, training or a digital uh, literacy class look like? in the most unconducive environment. I'm from South Africa, which is a really, really interesting place because we have some uh, a, a population of schools and teachers that represent globally competitive um, world-class schools and private school sector. And then you have the poorest of the poor, like every, and everything in between. And so um, I think the typical classroom looks something akin to a smart board, a digitally empowered teacher and um, students um, using their own devices often. Um, and what you're seeing in a lot of first world countries is, is a multiple device to student ratio. So often students have three or four devices to one student, which is just a, a whole set of challenges and um, opportunities in of itself. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have students who have almost no technology. And sometimes the only technology will be that of a teacher. And that is often just limited to a phone. So that is a very interesting dynamic because how do we uh, deploy resources into the, those situations? Um, how do you deal with low um, internet connectivity, poor bandwidth? Um, we've seen some really, really interesting things, even um, with folks teaching coding skills. Um, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, there are a bunch of what they call no code or like no device coding activities happening just to introduce um, computational thinking and ideas into the classroom. Um, there's amazing efforts by um, Lego, often in this place, using play-based learning um, and a program called Six Bricks to introduce computational thinking and basically low, like no code um, concepts, but introducing co computational thinking um, and coding skills in the classroom. But th that's really, really your basic, um, you know, digital literacy. I think we still have a lot of unexplored territory in terms of really leveraging mobile and gathering data because one of the most um, valuable things we can really understand is our student enrollment in schools. Um, we have very limited data on student enrollment in your um, rural areas. And, and this is one of the things that can really just leverage um, 
uh, getting the right resources into those environments. If we could just understand attendance data, basic things like that. There are a couple of really interesting startups working in that specific space as a, um, a leveraged intervention. Um, just because the power of knowing how students are attending school and and increasing their attendance um, can help build the pathways to a better education. So, and it, empowering teachers with that data. Interesting. Uh, you know, you talked about play-based learning as part of the digital literacy training that some of these uh, foundational classes look like. I remember during our times, the first digital literacy training that we ever got was Microsoft Word. But, you know, when, when you look at the benefits that are bound when you talk about digital literacy training and the skills that are then earned or learned uh, throughout the education system, you know, we also have to talk about what education challenges digital literacy can solve. And uh, Yevgenia, I want to bring you in on this one. Um, given your experience, what education challenges does digital literacy solve? Really, uh, let's look at different uh, stakeholders who are involved in the um, in digital literacy. For students, to me, digital literacy gives an ability to study anywhere, anytime with technology-enabled digital literacy. And um, as Elliot said earlier, pandemic really uh, made thinkers hard how to do it. Schools in some countries were closed for almost a year, year and a half. Uh, what the students learn uh, a lost immense amount of knowledge uh, and some of them will never come back to schools so to me uh, for students it's uh, really clear the um, challenges that it can solve for educational officials and this is something which Gabi touched upon digital skills are critical for managing education systems with edu uh, uh, education management information systems uh, the Ministry of Education must know where to deploy resources. So what are the enrollments of students? And digital skills are critical from that perspective. For teachers, it's really uh, ability to improve lessons planned, to deliver high engaging lessons, but also support for them. Uh, they can uh, talk on WhatsApp, just like simple examples. In Kenya, they have teacher, and I think in South Africa, two teacher WhatsApp groups which help them to kind of brainstorm with each other how to better deliver the, uh, the, the lessons in a difficult environments. Um, and finally, parents. Parents here are critical. Um, we know that for many kids uh, who went to school, their parents are illiterate. Uh, equipping uh, parents with basic, basic digital skills and even mobile uh, penetration is critical here, is important. Uh, we saw, for example, in some South Asian countries, there were impact evaluations that illiterate parents can easily figure out on a phone with a few um, emojis how he, her or his uh, uh, son or daughter are doing. So to me, the uh, education um, uh, benefits are enormous and digital literacy is a must across multiple stakeholders involved in the education process. Just like you put it, the benefits are enormous and uh, what challenges digital literacy can solve as well are enormous. So what conditions do we need to meet for digital literacy to work for education? I think one of the fundamental one really has to do with uh, that enabling environment. Uh, governments and different uh, players, uh, international uh, development agencies like the World Bank, uh, institutions like the MasterCard Foundation, we all have a role to actually play in terms of how do we actually create that a conducive environment, government, of course, leading on that. And it's not, it's not something that the government can only do alone. Uh, from a policy perspective, it has to be sort of a hand-in-hand -hand sort of process that we have to work on together. Um, beyond that, really, which I think what policy then supports are issues to do with infrastructure. Um, and um, uh, I think the fact that we have a mobile ready uh, and all that, uh, but I think it's also... Uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done also to make sure that that infrastructure is not just there, but it's also reliable and actually available. I just wanted to add a sort of uh, maybe a perspective also from the, I would say maybe forefronts of um, innovation and startups. I think there's something really exciting with artificial intelligence, really, um, especially some, you know, everyone's been talking about ChatGPT, but when you actually ask the average teacher, have you even tried to use this technology? Oh, yeah. They say no. So, you know, the, the the gain there, um, you know, your, to your point, you're saying 
content needs to be av available and curated. Well, large language models and AI systems present this tremendous opportunity where the average system can pass an advanced mathematics test or computer science yep. test. So the, the content knowledge and the ability for a tutoring system to be available and for any child anywhere to have access to um, a system that can actually um, empower them with with you know really high quality content is there. The technology is there now. And that is a very, very exciting, I think, moment in time for us right now. Um, now the question becomes is how do we engineer communities that know how to leverage these systems? Um, and how do we engineer um, communities where um, these skills are valued? I think, you know, where career paths in, you know, technology fields, in science, STEM, you know, engineering, mathematics, um, computer science, data science, um, where those are career paths that are celebrated and valued um, uh, as, as choices. And, and really, we need to also expose our teaching force to those changes, because if we, our teachers exist in silos, um, that, that, you know, we we won't see that progression. And so I think what's exciting to me is that the role of the teacher, if you try and think about how do we reimagine the classroom um, for this new future, the role of the teacher fundamentally changes from being a content expert to actually a coach, somebody who's um, tuned into students' learning goals, their ability, where they're at, managing data, helping motivate, set goals, and, and, that, and really fostering communities of learning and content knowledge um, is is online and in systems. And so then if that is, is if that is the opportunity, then it's fundamental that we get infrastructure and connectivity right so that every student has access to those opportunities and every teacher can also learn. And I, I'm really, really excited about that future because I think there's tremendous leverage for the African continent in that paradigm. Well, look at the numbers that we're looking at here. They say by the year 2060, 750 million children are expected to be of school age. And if we are to go by the 750 million uh, learners figure, one would then ask, um, how do we strengthen our digital literacy skills to be able to benefit this expanding, knowledge-hungry, education-hungry population that we currently have? Because what's happening here is that while uh, there are many continents in the world that are having an aging population, we are having an expanding population at the bottom. So we have a much more younger population in Africa than the rest of the world. So how do we make sure that they are growing up digitally aware uh, in terms of literacy and skills? Evgenia. This is a huge challenge, and this is a challenge widely recognized, I think, uh, across all countries in Africa. And uh, the World Bank actually is partnering with MasterCard Foundation right now to address this challenge. Uh, we are thinking through across uh, many countries uh, on the continent, thinking through the ways on how to address it at the policy level, at the operational level, to ensure that it really benefits students, teachers, parents, community at large. To begin with, every country needs to have a clear policy and strategy related to uh, digital uh, literacy, digital skills, and things like that. Uh, currently, every country has education policy, so this is something to kind of think through and address uh, as well. Keeping in mind that this is not only Ministry of Education who needs to be thinking about it. This is the whole government approach, including uh, Ministry of Infrastructure, uh, Ministry of Telecom, um, Ministry of Finance to think how to finance all of these things. Second, countries need to have digital skills competency frameworks, similarly as we have for other skills in education sector. Uh, these frameworks will guide the curriculum development, but the good thing about uh, this uh, digital world is that uh, for African countries specifically, there is absolutely no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, these uh, frameworks are already available online. Digital skills, the digital skills, uh, I don't know, in Nigeria, it's the same digital skills which are required in um, Seattle. Currently, there is a UNESCO digital skills framework, uh, which has been adopted from EU digital skills framework. So we're working with multiple countries, and I personally had experience working in Nigeria, how to adapt these frameworks to the country 
context. Other two important aspects, and we touched based on this already, are teachers, those who will be delivering the knowledge, and as uh, Gabi said, they are coaches. So teachers need to be trained in a different way on how to impart digital skills for students. It's not necessarily a class on digital literacy. It's uh, how the digital literacy is used in mathematics, uh, physics, creative thinking, and things like that. There is no way around it, be it uh, mobile devices, be it tablets, be it computers. So this is something which governments need to think about. Enid, I see you itching to add something on this. And I want you to tie this to uh, the fact that, you know, e-learning is also one model of education that is increasingly being adopted in Africa. And so I wanted to hear from you, in addition to what you wanted to add, how can we leverage the already existing infrastructure on the continent uh, of e-learning to also tie it into growing the digital literacy uh, skills we have on the continent. I was having a conversation with a colleague and um, and, and the fact that um, that removes you know, the cost of upfront investment of having to lay cables and all that is taken off. And, and I think, you know, uh, uh, the opportunity to leverage on the law of all is really amazing in that from that particular perspective and all that. And 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 I think one of the other things that we probably also touched on is really making sure that content that is being generated right now, we look at some of the latest statistics, the bulk of the content that we consume within the continent is actually not generated from the continent. Yeah. And, and there has to be a lot of concerted effort in terms of building skills, uh, to make sure that we are able to generate our own content, you know, and, and I think that's really a very important uh, component and all that. But but I think the uh, looking at uh, e-learning uh, as one of the hybrid models and how we can leverage, you know, uh, that as as a way of accelerating digital skills within within the continent. I think um, the the couple of things, you know, um, one is uh, think of the open. Uh, educational resources, you know, that encourage a lot more sharing and all of that. And and which I think when you think about e-learning right now, there's perhaps a high adoption happening at the university level and all that. And I think that we, they are playing and we're playing a bigger role in making sure that there are more resources going back to the content generation and content production, uh, content um, uh, building for the content and all that, you know. Um, but, but also in terms of just online platforms and allowing for uh, more and multiple and different users to actually come in and, and, and access that and all that. Um, the other one that I think is, is amazing, and this is one of the, that is already being done using leverage on e-learning and on uh, online learning as it were, is um, making sure that even at the time when students are coming into school, they are digitally ready. You know, they would have to, they, they can take and, and universities and all that can actually be able to contribute to this component by making sure that they, they produce content or they are able to uh, allow for anyone who wants to take a pre-university course. When you look at the different ways in which e-learning as well can be leveraged in terms of making sure that also the digital literacy skills are going up, um, there are questions around uh, the fact that there's just maybe about 40% of learners on the continent, generally a population on the African continent that have access to internet. And then you think about how much this trickles down into whether or not they have these digital literacy devices. But then the question is, what is the role um, of other stakeholders in growing a digitally literate young African population for better education experiences? And uh, Gabby, you've mentioned uh, how you've interacted with, uh, you know, artificial intelligence. And I'm sure through this, you have interacted with stakeholders like telcos. How do you think we need to go about addressing the situation where we are looking at 40% internet access, but at the same time, uh, the global average is at 66%. We really have to show folks what the potential is with mobile devices. Um, you know, uh, purchasing uh, data for social apps is very, very popular on the African continent, not something necessarily um, popular um, in other places, but you can purchase discounted uh, data for your social apps, which is very, very interesting. And then there's uh, essentially um, 
some support in terms of you have connectivity, but it's limited in a certain way. And if we can extend that kind of thinking and usage to things beyond your WhatsApps, your TikToks, your YouTube, and extend that to learning platforms and really uh, um, model to populations that you can use your phone for learning, um, there is tremendous potential with this. We've actually seen um, on small scale experiments where we've set up a, a, a mobile hotspot in a, in a community, um, basically in a mom's home where um, children can gather and use the internet and they can come and learn to read and practice mathematics. All of a sudden, one you, you see there's a smartphone at least within the household, maybe not to every child, but within the household that they have access to um, uh, um, for certain periods of the day. And secondly, the community then starts to value the internet differently. So all of a sudden you see the purchasing power of community shift. So instead of spending um, you know, your $50 a month that you would spend on uh, a TV subscription or a TV license, all of a sudden, um, or other types of subscriptions that the household does have, you could see that shift towards um, purchasing an internet. And that, that's been really, really interesting. And I think that's where telcos can really look at um, expanding their research and data and really seeing how to um, move how people spend their money on that way. But really to do that, we need to understand how to encourage folks to access these opportunities. And I think one of the most exciting things about something like software development um, and exposing people to those types of career choices and digital skills is often these skills are skills-based opportunities. And what that means is you do not have to go to university um, or have a, a specific formal accreditation to be able to participate in the workforce. I think that is maybe one of the most leveraged things is where people can actually start earning an income from the skills they're learning and they can teach themselves, you know, like you say, on open platforms, the tremendous amounts of resources. And, and that I think is one of the most uh, equitable things about digital skills is that if you are competent, uh, you don't need an accreditation. You can actually have a portfolio of work and your portfolio of work can create opportunities for you. And if we can take that thinking and bring that down into your into your high school um, where students can start putting together a portfolio of work, you know, um, folks even exiting halfway through school could even access opportunities, economic opportunities to support themselves and their families. Evgenia, you want to add something to that? When we're talking about 40%, it's about 40% uh, of population who are using the internet. But in fact, right. and this is something which Garby mentioned, over 80% of the population has access to internet. It's just they're not using. And I really love the ways how Gabi described different ways to change the mind shift, to engage uh, people using internet for productive ways, for educational ways, and things like that. And I just wanted to add one uh, thing on this, um, specifically for education, and specifically during COVID times, uh, this made us at the World Bank started thinking creatively together with the ministers of education, how to ensure that students uh, continue getting the uh, um, access to education and things like that. So one of the creative ways probably working with telecoms, and this is uh, what Gabi mentioned at the government policy level, is to think how to allow access to the educational websites, free for students, or maybe you have login, you have password, free for schools, free for teachers, free for universities. So this is something at the government level I can discuss. I like the fact that you said that of the 40%, 80% are not using the internet. And uh, this was actually also reiterated by, I think it was President Paul Kagame at the Transform Africa Summit, um, where we had another edition of EdTech Mondays in Zimbabwe. And he said that, uh, the fact that people are not using the internet speaks to the fact that we need to invest in digital literacy skills. And I think he was right. He was spot on on that one. And looking at further statistics, I think this show is really packed with statistics. By 2030, Africa will encompass about 625 million people who require digital skills, more than 50% of all the jobs in Kenya and 35 to 45% of jobs in Rwanda, Nigeria, and, you know, Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire. And so now we're wondering what initiatives are being taken to support this kind of um, job market elevation. Can we get to a point where we say because of digital literacy skills, this is where Africa is at? 
currently across all of our global practices discussing specifically this question, youth, jobs, skills, and digital skills are number one on their list. From the World Bank perspective, I mentioned uh, at the policy level, we have this exciting uh, um, collaboration with the MasterCard Foundation to kind of help governments to think through more holistically about the digital skills and how to implement them in the educational uh, systems. At the project level, uh, more concretely, uh, I think currently almost any education project at the World Bank that you look at from basic education onwards uh, looks um, uh, into the digital skills. Um, just to give you a few examples, for example, and then um, basic education in Rwanda, we are working with teachers um, to how support development of their digital skills. In Uganda, at the secondary level project, we're equipping schools uh, with devices uh, and supporting teachers to use digital uh, skills content. This is something which Elliot mentioned multiple times, which is very important how to, to, to use this content um, uh, on the devices. In the DRC, where I currently work, uh, we uh, work on the Girls Empowerment Project and digital skills. This is something uh, I think needs to be highlighted. It's the really breakthrough for many girls in terms of accessing information, accessing jobs of the safety of uh, their home sometimes. Uh, so equipping girls uh, with the digital skills really will level the playing field for them in the labor market, but also uh, provide some other services, uh, for example, um, kind of on uh, uh, reproductive health and things like that. So um, these are some things that we are doing. But uh, other thing I wanted to mention, and this is something which you just said in the very beginning of uh, our conversation, is moving on to the higher education. It's really heartbreaking to see that only 11% of tertiary graduates uh, have something to do with STEM or digital skills. And I think Gabby mentioned that as well. So from the World Bank, we have um, a flagship program, uh, African um, Centers of Excellence, uh, which are heavily focused on STEM, uh, some uh, digital uh, programs and things like that. We also have a strip, uh, which is more technical vocational education uh, level in the East Africa, uh, which is also focusing on digital skills uh, and other STEM skills. Elid, what do you think about uh, the fact that, you know, we might need to see a situation where we need to build the foundation for it to make sense in uh, education systems so it can in the future make sense for uh, the jobs market? Some countries, uh, certainly Kenya being one of them, um, is something that we're already starting to is already being thought through with the um, introduction of uh, uh, some uh, digital skills training or use of computer and all that um, uh, at that early level. Um, uh, I re do recall a couple of days ago, my my daughter had mentioned to me that she had an assignment to complete in Google Classroom and uh, she's six, seven years old. And uh, my worry was, would she know how to navigate and all? Well, what amazed me, especially, is how she was able to navigate within that particular platform and do it and all. And I'm sure that would be the same with other kids and all that um, within within that classroom and all that. It's it's really how early do we introduce these skills and how uh, do we are able to leverage on whatever platform or whatever network, obviously. Uh, there are challenges abound in different places, not the same infrastructure and all that. But the question is, how do we meaningfully and how do we introduce some of these skills really earlier on? It shouldn't be um, an option that we're doing this. It shouldn't really be part and parcel of everything else that we do, particularly within our education systems. Um, so, uh, and, and that's, again, back to what Eugenia mentioned about from a policy perspective and all that. So it really has to be introduced early. I think waiting for it to uh, to a later point is creates perhaps a bigger problem uh, later and all that. But but then beyond that also is really have to acknowledge and and realize that where the jobs of the future really are in the digital space, the bulk of those would be finding and all that going back to the global village and all that, and making sure that those skills are really um, uh, are we built for the skills and making sure that they are actually ready. Uh, as it were, within within that particular space, um, and 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 I think the 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 other one really for me is is leveraging whatever platform it is that is available to uh, drive some of these particular digital skills. 
there isn't um, a manual or anything that you go out there to learn about perhaps about the platform, like some of the social platform. But you find that people really catch on how to use them and learn. And the question is, how do we leverage on how some of those platforms have been designed to easily spread uh, on those on those particular digital skills? When we think about uh, digital literacy, we always hoping that it will not just benefit the learners; it will also benefit the teaching staff uh, that take these learners through, uh, you know, whatever pedagogical teaching approaches. There's people out there who would like to employ uh, teachers, but at the same time, they would also want in the future to have a market-ready uh, employee. So, what are those skills that we hope we can? impart into learners and our teachers so that we are seeing that digital literacy is benefiting education systems across Africa. I just want to kind of link to um, the comment from Elliot for, about moving uh, tech, you know, ed tech technologies to something akin to consumer applications. Um, mm -hmm. And also linking back to our, the actual numbers on internet use, users. So um, I think you know, actually in, in Africa, 82% of users using the internet um, or 82% of the users accessing the internet are doing so via smartphones. And those are through consumer-focused apps. And there's something really interesting there, which is the self-learning loop. P you know, folks being able to teach themselves to use those technologies and then connect to a global world. And I really think we need to try and um, encourage and invest in in, in companies and um, the private sector to design applications that are both mobile first, but also consumer focused, learning loops that um, enable educators and students to teach themselves. Um, and also ones that encourage job embedded pathways. So, you know, learning pathways where teachers are learning digital skills, but that, that those are maybe also pathways to other opportunities in Africa and globally, there's a teacher shortage trend. And so there's a big, you know, 20 by 2030, there will be 26, a shortfall of 26 million teachers globally. And most of those will actually be in Africa. And then the question becomes is how will we get more people um, into education to fill those roles? And I'm pretty confident that we need to elevate the role of teachers um, and those opportunities to be pathways to uh, you know, uh, innovative, digital first, um, connected world um, to make the role of teaching a more um, competitive, exciting, um, you know, opportunity for people, young people to want to go into. Um, and, and, and I think the same goes for um, it, it digital or it job embedded learning in your high school years too. So again, back to the idea of building a digital portfolio, demonstrating your knowledge and skills, and um, that is really, really important. So job embeddings, learning on the job um, loops where you can show what you know um, through doing. Thinking holistically about teachers and students, I think um, through the digital skills, there is a huge opportunity to really develop uh, a big set of other skills which will be required in the 20. We are currently in the 21st century, which are required for 21st century jobs and uh, growth. Um, this uh, we are talking about teamwork. Students can easily do uh, homeworks together uh, through uh, digital applications. We are talking about critical thinking. Uh, we are talking about problem solving. So all of that uh, together is very important. Um, uh, to, to really master it, uh, digital skills would be critical. For teachers, I think uh, I really like the answer of uh, Gabi in terms of elevating uh, teacher profession and uh, this idea of uh, showing pathways into something creative. Teacher profession is not only about, um, you know, teaching the, the basic stuff, but basically being a coach, uh, being at the forefront of what's happening. I think this is something in terms of... Um, uh, elevating teacher profession, giving the right incentive. This is something uh, at the World Bank we are constantly talking uh, how to improve the management of the teacher force because let's face it, teacher force 
Uh, it's the largest public investment and it's the largest share of the government uh, budget. So it's really critical to make sure that the uh, teachers are motivated, excited, and most importantly, they are conveying this excitement to the to our future, to our kids. What I think I'd probably want to add really there is is the role of parents in this, you know, um, as we even talk about teachers and all that. I think it's how do we bring parents along as we do this uh, uh, and making sure that they play an even bigger role in making sure that uh, we are able to accelerate digital skills within this particular space. So I think for me, parents would be a bigger component and actually absolutely this 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 discussion. And also beyond that really is 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 access to devices. You know, we talk about infrastructure and all that, really access to devices um, uh, in, in a way that um, allows for more equity and inclusion across board. Great. And I guess with that, we sort of know what initiatives we need to put in place to accelerate uh, digital literacy to benefit our education systems. And there couldn't be a better way to close off this conversation. So I want to say thank you to each and all of us for making time to be a part of EdTech Monday's conversations uh, that are focused on digital literacy as well. Um, and with the core goal of benefiting education systems. So thank you, Eugenia, uh, for making time for this. We do appreciate that. Gabby, thank you so much for making time as well. And Iliad with us in studio here today. Thank you so much for making time. We do appreciate this. And uh, until the next one, remember you can email us on edtechmonday at mastercardfdn.org. And we'll be so glad to read. We do read your emails, each and all of them. And we do share our feedback as well. So thank you all so much. Until the next one, it's been great having you. Join us for this conversation. Bye-bye for now. EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning in ICT and is part of the Foundation's Young Africa Works programming.